Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, humanoids of all descriptions, welcome to the basement railroad room for this month's model railroad video. This month, I'm going to go over constructing the subfloor for the mushroom layout, and as I said last month, we're going to take a look at the uh, bridging that's going to have to take place to cross the four foot wide aisle here um, at the end of the layout. So, when it comes to bridging, although you're still looking for a model because it's small, uh, the thing is, the bridge actually has to function as a bridge. It has to look like a bridge, it has to carry a dead load if you stop a train on the bridge, and it has to carry what engineers call the live load of the train moving across the bridge. There's a couple of ways to do this. You can buy kits or you can scratch build. Both have uh, their own special set of challenges. On my previous railroad when I was in college, you know, one of the thing, one of my goals for that railroad was to along with making, seeing what mistakes were to be made, to also learn about bridging, because I knew I was going to have to build some, and not the kind I built in the Army. So, this is a bridge that I built for my previous railroad, and there are some lessons from this. The first lesson is that the white styrene tubing, where there's square around from Plastruck, although it looks nice, even if you use the correct geometry, it's not strong enough. So what I had to do, you could see that the end of the square tube, also which has these uh, C, col C columns glued to it, needed to have brass tube inserted into it. So, quality HO scale locomotives are fairly heavy. So, at the time we uh, had a hobby shop in our area that wasn't simply model trains. And they had a selection of brass tubing available. If you're going to go this route, you're going to have to find a hobby shop with a selection of brass tubing and not bar, but tube, at least in, in my opinion. You're going to have to find two tubes for each side, and I'm talking about to fill the lower stringer. Two large ones that will just fill the space in the lower stringer, and two smaller diameter, same length tubes. The smaller one has to be of a size that will just barely not fit in the larger one. Cut them to your desired length with a tube cutter. Um, and I'll show you one of those in a second. Then put them in your freezer in your kitchen. Because of physics, stuff that's cold is slightly smaller than stuff that's, that's warm. And your kitchen freezer or your tub freezer in your garage or wherever is going to create just enough shrinkage that the larger tube will fit around the small tube when they warm up you're going to have what's called an interference fit and doing that with this bridge was just enough to make this bridge nice and strong and yet it's still very light. Let me go and show you a pipe cutter now. This here is a tube cutter. 
or perhaps you prefer to call it a pipe cutter. It has a main body and as I turn this wheel here you can see that this um, this jaw over here which is on a screw will move back and forth. Inside the main body there's a wheel. See if I can find something that'll help you see that. Maybe you could see the wheel that's in here. The way this works is you're going to take a tube. This is a piece of styrene. You're going to close the tube down so that it just fits the um, you're going to close the jaw down so the tube just fits. So now that wheel is touching the tube and just start to turn the tube, give it a couple of turns, just tighten the wheel a little bit. And as you do that, we take it back out, it'll start to cut the tube. These little plastic tools like this are just strong enough to not only cut styrene, but they'll also cut the type of brass that you buy for model railroad applications in hobby shops or catalogs like the Walther's catalog. And as I talk, I continue to turn this, tighten it up a little bit, and there we go. You cut your piece of tube and it's a square end and it's nice and clean. If you do brass, you may have a burr. If you do, gently run a file or a piece of emery cloth around it. Now, obviously I have my stud wall here. Behind the stud wall is a thermal blanket which is code in my area. So I'm going to have to start by measuring the bench work up here that's going to hold the, that, that'll hold the track and the scenery and I'm going to come across and it's going to, everything's going to be supported and what I'm going to have to do is put a piece of um, tempered hardboard which I've already shown you here in several, on a couple of different video series. You get it at big box stores. I get mine at, at, a, at a chain where the uh, buckets are orange. Uh, it's marketed under a couple of different names. One trade name is Masonite. Where I get it from, it's marketed as Equiboard, and it's a paper product. When we mount it here to cover up the stud wall, it's going to be smooth side out. It takes primer nicely and then over the primer it'll take paint and it'll give us a sky background. Let me adjust the camera and show you what goes underneath the floor that people are going to stand on. Well, here we are. And this is basically what goes into building the floor for your house. I have a 2x10 box. I use Spax construction screws. They're not uh, giving me anything to say that. I've only got at this point more like 21 subscribers. Um, I find that they're extremely strong. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at the box here. And these will always, in my experience, self-start. They're very sharp. The heads don't strip easily. And they not only, if you go on the internet and you start looking up the specifications, these, um, what are they, number eights, number eight construction screws. They have what appears to be a gold titanium nitride uh, coating on them, so they're not gonna corrode. And on an individual basis, the, um, 
the screws will hold several hundred pounds each before they break. Uh, underneath that, I had a knee wall here of two by fours. And so this will hold a, a good number of adult size operators, just like walking around on the floor in your house. In order to get plywood down here in the basement, I have to bring in half sheets. So one of the things that I do is I like to have a little extra attachment. So I put pieces of two by four on the sides of the two by 10 where, this, where there's going to be a seam just to ensure that nobody goes through the floor. When I go to build the next section of this, all I have to do is take some three inch construction screws and attach the next section to the front to back and then I can put on the next section of floor. Is it expensive? Well, a little bit, but it allows me to have the amount of railroad that I want. Remember, every model railroad is a compromise in some way, shape, or form. So, now we started off talking about bridging. I've scratch built bridges before, as a matter of fact, a fairly long one, and I showed you the remains of one of those bridges. Let's head upstairs and take a quick look at the kits that I'm going to build in order to determine where the, um, the bench work is going to have to go in order to have the track height that I want and the terrain features that I've decided I want to have in this area behind me. All right, here we are with the uh, components that are going to go into most of making this bridge. The first thing we have to think about is that bridges don't just sit on the ground at the end. And so I'm going to use this cleaning rod here as a pointer. We have bridge abutments. bridge abutment has a couple of functions. It holds back the earth with these wings. You know, so it holds back, it holds back the fill underneath the bridge. It has, a, and it has this shelf here that the weight of the bridge bears down on. Now the bridge doesn't actually just sit on the abutment. Every bridge is pretty much a custom affair no matter how it's built. So we need bridge shoes and adapters. They go and transfer the bridge's weight onto the abutment. And this is a different type of bridge shoe right here. We're going to need several different types of bridge. We're going to need plate girders. We're going to need a tower, and we're going to need two truss bridges. Additionally, one of the things we're going to need, because again, everything is at least semi-custom when we talk about bridging, is I have built, I've put together five sets, five bags of Central Valley truss kits. And that will go ahead and allow me some flexibility 
in supporting the bridge. In addition to that, over here, I've pulled up the land of Fa, just a whole bunch of loose pieces uh, of plastruct, uh, various structural shapes, tubes, girders, sea channels, and there's some uh, some trusses, but they're the wrong type of the, for a bridge. So those are the kits that I'm going to use. Now let's take a look at the tools that I'm going to need. Okay, this is a pretty decent selection of tools for model railroaders and modeling in general. So, what do we have here? Well, the first thing that I've got here is a pair of sprue nippers for cutting pieces of, of uh, material, uh, the um, molded parts, off of the sprues that they come attached to. That particular tool is only for plastic. I've got a pair of flush cutting pliers and a pair of side cutters. Those two are both strong enough for thin wire if I need it. I have three different kinds of tweezers. Here, I, what I've got is dental picks, two different types. There are some curved ones down in the basement, and a couple of straight ones. A quality multi-tool is hard to beat. An X-Acto knife, which I didn't bring up, because we all know an we probably all know what an X-Acto knife looks like. Although you may not know it, X-Acto also makes a miter box and a fine saw. There are saws from X-Acto that are finer than this one, if I need it. Obviously, we have here some uh, adhesive and evaporative glue. I have an HO scale, well, a multi scale model railroader ruler, HO scale, S scale, O scale, and on the back, N. And I've got something else that a lot of modelers in various scales may not think about. This is a hemostat. It's shaped like a pair of scissors, but they're really a fine pair of pliers. And if you listen closely, they lock. And then to get them to unlock, all you have to do is push them apart at the base. You can find this in various small tool catalogs like Micromark or you can go to larger gun shows. There's almost always an area at a gun show where somebody's selling stuff that's alleged to be medical supplies, and that's where you find these. They're really not expensive. They do have some serration. If you don't want the serration, it doesn't take much to get rid of the serration to have it ground off. And finally, if you're familiar with uh, job shops that do metalwork and blacksmithing, one of the things that they tend to have is a granite surface plate to ensure that things that need to be flat are actually flat. Well, we're building a bridge from plastic on a model railroad. We don't need something that's a granite surface plate, but I do have very fine sandpaper stapled to a scrap plywood. 
Is it perfectly flat? No, absolutely not. But this is going to be as flat as I need it to be. So in next month's video, we'll show you some completed bridges and we'll also have pieces of stud wall complete where we should also go ahead and have the uh, the sky backdrop put up with screws and uh, primered and painted. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next month.